Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 181 of Real Blend, a podcast that has the ghost of Roger Deakins inside of it. My name is Sean O'Connell, welcoming you to a new episode. On this week's show, we have Dune Reactions. Not very spoilery. We're going to keep the details uh, at a minimum. No spoiler, uh, by the way. Like, this yeah, no is going to be spoilers. very, very, very quick reactions. Yeah. Well, we'll say we said we say we saw it, but like, we'll talk about that at the very right. least. But uh, uh, James Wan has a new film called Malignant that's hitting theaters and HBO Max. And our guest this week is Gavin O'Connor, uh, who is talking to us specifically about his film, his amazing film, Warrior, uh, which is turning 10. Uh, and so we're going to get to a lot of uh, a lot of show. Now I'll start with introductions, starting with Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hi, Kev. Jonathan, Jacob, Gabriel. I went I went all three full names Wow, today. I was just about to see who got left out, but no one got left out today. Normally no. I do two, but I wanted to do all three. I just, just felt like after that interview we did this weekend, it just felt like we're closer than ever. I didn't realize that it was Blue Shirt Day, too. No one gave me the memo, so... Uh, <laughs> In his hands, we said that shirt. in the uh, the other text thread. Sorry, Damn yeah, it. yeah, yeah. One day I'll get into that one. Well, this was the episode where we were going to vote someone out. We thought, what was the coolest way that we could indicate how we're voting someone out? I of the show? started this show, <laughs> you can't vote me out. That's why we're voting you out because you started the show. <laughs> I mean, I, this feels like one of those like cliche band biopics where he's like, I started this band. <laughs> uh, it's Jake Hamilton of uh, Fox 32 in Chicago. Hi, Can Jake. you hear the the woof, woof, woof? Uh, no. and I'm curious, there is a, a massive storm blowing through Chicago right now, and my poor, scared little child is right right off camera, uh, so she, she might be joining us as fifth chair for Real Blend today, because she's Aww. scared. For any new she listeners, really his scared, scared little child is a dog, just yes. to be clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in, in Jake's defense, Laura and I do call Jack and Sally our children, so I, yes. I, I, I do understand that. For, I just want to make sure people didn't think he was neglecting a child to record <laughs> Gabe, a movie at, podcast. At this point in the video <laughs> podcast, are you able to throw up that graphic of the three dogs hosting? <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Teal blend. Teal blend. Yes. This is a spectacular yeah. uh, photo Shout shop. out to Donovan, who's our, yeah, uh, our great Real Blend Was listener. that who did he, it? Yeah. 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 Wow. So, I, should, I, should, I don't know why I'm surprised. People on our show should know who he is if you've listened before. He's the gentleman who created that awesome poster. When we were leaving the Quentin Tarantino live event at the New Beverly, he handed us this like poster he made uh, that I still have in my kitchen that I, I see every single morning when I before I go to work. Um, so thank you to Donovan for being an awesome listener. All right, housekeeping. If you're watching us on the YouTube channel that I just mentioned, thank you very much for joining us. Head down, give us a like and a subscribe. Join us here each and every week for the video component of the podcast. For our audio listeners, if you want to get in on that action, go to youtube.com backslash Real Blend Podcast. Uh, have you signed up for Real Blend Premium? You can get an ad-free version of the show, uh, an extra segment each week for us that drops on Mondays, and a newsletter from me every other week. And this week is a news blend... Uh, week i believe a letter also some is... very heavy whispering into microphones if you if yeah. you want to listen to premium you get some yeah. very heavy whispering and and we end the show in a different way yeah we have a whole premium. other set of awesome. inside jokes that you're not a part of unless you <laughs> and then there's a whole bunch of other inside jokes <laughs> yeah. that we will never bring to the show <laughs> unfortunately so make sure you exclusive follow exclusive to our text thread go to the premium and sign up for us because it's a lot of fun uh let's get the weekly poll so uh, I asked everybody if uh, if you were able to go see Shang-Chi, and it turns out that a lot of you guys were able to go see it. The movie posted tremendous box office numbers for a Labor Day weekend. Um, but if you were able to go, how would you rank uh, the film in terms of the MCU slate? And I called it, uh, I gave top tier, mid tier, and lower tier. And I've now realized the top tier would have to mean top eight, because there have been 24 films in the MCU up to this point. Because... Um, after my second viewing of it, I was immediately like, no, that's top tier. That's top tier MCU. I really like it a lot. Um, but then once you realized, you know, you start naming eight other films that could be in that top tier, it gets really hard. So let's first discuss the poll and then we're each going to give our top selections of Marvel movies to see where where Shang-Chi would land. So, Kev, I'm going to go to you. Tell me what you think the audience said and then we'll get to our lists. Uh <sighs> It's interesting. I see the 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 hard thing about this poll is that even though I would consider top tier, I would consider Shang Chi top tier. Mm. I don't know that it would be in my top eight, but I still think it's one of the best Marvel films. So like cutting it off at that eight kind of like makes this a harder decision to make. Uh, I'm gonna guess our audience went mid tier because if it really boils down to the eight eight eight, mm. then I can't. I mean, when when we get to our list, you'll see. 
But I do consider it one of the best Marvel films, but it's got to be mid-tier, right? It has to be. 61%. 61 put it in the top tier. Wow. So this played very well with uh, mm. Real Blend listeners. And so good. and then tw- it's very 32% good. said mid-tier and only 7% said lower tier. Um, so I'm going to give my eight real fast. Uh, and I'm going to tell you where Shang-Chi would land on it. I have Endgame 1 and I have Infinity War 2. I, I would like to cheat and make them one combined movie, Kill Bill style. Jake Can't won't let me, as you can tell from yep. his face. So I'm going to put Endgame ahead of Infinity War, but Infinity War is 2. I have Civil War three. I have Spider Man Homecoming four. I have the Winter Sol- uh, Captain America Winter Soldier five. I have Black Panther. I have the original Avengers, and then at eight, I have a. I, I mean, eight is where Shang Chi could fall, mm-hmm. but if it's going to fall, it's going to knock out either Doctor Strange or Guardians of the Galaxy. Like those three movies, that's where I put it. That's that's in the realm of where I put it. Doctor Strange, the first Guardians, and Shang Chi. None of those movies are going to beat the seven that I just listed above it, but that's kind of where it would fall. Well, well then what's your definitive number eight then? You have to make a decision. I'm picking Doctor Strange. Okay. So that, I guess that would make it mid-tier. Mid-tier, but I still think it's, I th- I think it's really good. Now you see my, my conflict because I think Shang-Chi is definitely top tier Marvel. But when yeah. you're when you're breaking it down new, like mathematically like this, it's it, it falls mid-tier, which is why I gave the mid-tier answer. But... It's still one of the best Marvel films I've seen. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's it, when you're breaking it down like this, it's a little harder, I would argue. Did you do your list? But but yeah. mid, maybe is it just that mid tier comes with it a certain connotation? But based, I mean, but you it, you love it. It's great. But in terms of technicality, where you would rank, it would rank mid tier. It's just a testament to the Marvel to the work of Marvel yeah. that their mid tier work is that good. Question: 100%. How how inflated would your top tier become? If we were to shift from it being um, a hard number, like like just segmenting out the tiers into even numbers, and right. you were to take the the quality star rating whatever approach, mm. and you were to say this is top tier, these hit a level that the mid tier doesn't, and mid tier hits a level that doesn't hit top tier, but it's better than these bottom tier. So do you mean like four stars and above would it be top tier? And like sure. anything like from and then from like. Th- Two and a half to four would be mid tier, and yeah. then anything under two and a half would be lower. Yeah, like and it's top tier because I'd give it four stars. Yeah, I gave it. I gave it four and a half. I gave okay. Shang Chi a four and a half. So, so maybe I'm we tier. should maybe we should change the way we, we look at the the tiering versus yeah. because there's so much that could. That, but I I that like the division that. of I don't know. There's something about the fact that that what are there there are 24 Marvel films now. Yes. That, 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 I, I, there's something about the fact that it's easily divisible. But three. I do like, I'd like the specifications that Gabe sure. is putting. Like, if Marvel has just made that many quote unquote top tier films, sure. which is if you say, I'm going to give it four stars or above, yeah. that puts it into the top tier. It's not their fault that they've made that many. Are you guys familiar with uh, it's sort of a meme thing that, that's that been going on for a long time now of the tier list ranking that people do online? No. Does that sound like the, is that the letterbox thing? Or maybe is we'll, maybe we'll do that in a we'll do that in a, a, a premium episode. But it, it's basically like F through S tier, S is like above A, and oh, you uh, yeah okay. you take I everything should, and you that. throw it into a rank. It's more yeah. qualitative than it is sure. Um, just sort of how you would rank it uh, numerically. So or however you would say that. Maybe we'll do that but, in a premium episode. That'd be fun. By the way, Shang Chi is the twenty fifth MCU film, not twenty four. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So I, I, don't mean, know, still, I don't know how that affects it, but it's just just a heads up. Yeah, just it's to say. still the eighth. It's yeah. still like eight no, is still a point. nice round number. Um, did good you do point. a list, Kevin? Did you I put did, them I did a list. Let's I hear did. your list then. Um, all right. So my list is. I'm gonna. I'll go, should I go eight to one or one to eight? Go one to eight. All right. Number one is Captain America: Winter Soldier. Uh, okay. Just because I've never seen the MCU was never that grounded in terms of action right before that moment. Like that movie changed everything for me in the MCU. Um, Infinity Wars number two, Captain America: Civil War number three, End Game four, Iron Man one five, okay. Spider Man Far From Home six, mm-hmm. Doctor Strange seven, and then and there I, I come to the same uh, issue you do with number eight, but I can't not put Guardians there. I just can't because okay. Guardians was such a massive. I mean, you have to think about when you walked out of Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. and how massively great that movie was. And as much as we like Shang Chi, we love Shang Chi. It's the current one, so we're like mm-hmm. we're we're in it kind it's of. It's got all so, the shine and gloss on it. Still. Yeah, so so it's a little hard to 
shake that because I, I have to remember where I was when I saw Guardians and walked out. Because Guardi I would put Guardians and Shang-Chi in a similar boat in the sense that I didn't know a ton about the Guardians and mm-hmm. I didn't know a ton about Shang-Chi going mm-hmm. in. So I learned a lot from both films and both are excellent. Like, I think Shang-Chi would be number nine. To be okay. honest with you, mm-hmm. um, so I'm, it, you know, Ant Man. I, I, you know, I'm just happy Doctor Strange. Top ten Strange's... Marvel is nothing to scoff at. No, yeah. right, yeah, out exactly. of twenty five films, yeah. 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 And the point I have to emphasize before I get to Jake's list is that this is a, a movie about Shang Chi. Like no one knows who this character is, yeah. and it made you know? so and, and much. Did you guys money. see that the final yeah. numbers ticked up? The four day total was ninety. Million. Yes, I saw that ninety. Which, by the way, can, the, the, during a pandemic. Uh, a character that not a lot of people know about, uh, a lead star that no one knew going Correct. into the weekend. Right. Um, all that tells you is that's the power of Marvel. Yes. Power of Marvel. I mean, and plus the reviews, the word because of mouth. Even when they were doing Captain Marvel, which would be the closest example of a of a origin story recently, they paired her with Samuel L. Jackson, who's a proven commodity in there. Uh, mm-hmm. Brie Larson was already a star, you know, up to that yep. point, far bigger than Simu Liu, you know, through, through no fault of his own. Uh, Jude Simu Law, Liu. Simu Liu, Jude Law was a co-star. Uh, Annette Benning was a co-star. <laughs> like mm-hmm. they packed that thing. Um, and then Eternals, you know, which is coming out now. Like no one knows the Eternals either, but that's chock full of stars. So I, I wonder, do you think Eternals does as good as Shang Chi? At this point, yes. Yeah, I do. I, I get, I get, a, I get a different vibe. Like when I watch the Shang Chi trailer, I don't know. There's an excitement to that trailer, and as much as I love the Eternals trailer and seeing. Yeah. Uh, Chloe Zhao's name on there. It feels a lot more indie Marvel than it does than now, it does Marvel Marvel. So for I'm sure. wondering how it's going to play for. Audiences. And again, this is not a uh, indication of anything, but there is a weird fascination with the Eternals on social media. They there's fan groups and anything Eternals that pops up. There's they it's like a hive, you know, it's the Eternals be huge. hive. Now they might not come, you know, that might not <sighs> matter. But for whatever reason, they're but all we, in on. Remind me after we're done, when we're moving into the premium recording that I have a spoilery question I want to ask you about the end credit scene of Shang Chi. It feels wrong oh. to discuss it right now, but oh okay. yeah, because I because I still have yes. not seen it. Jakey, what's your list? Do you have a list? Yeah. Well, here's what I'll say: is is uh, I as of this moment, as of this recording, um, hopefully by the time you're hearing this, I will have seen it. But as of this recording, I still have not seen Shang Chi. And if you're asking yourself, how is that possible? These guys know it's one of those weird things where when you don't do a junket and you miss a press screening because I had something else that kept yeah. me from going to the press screening. It's really hard sometimes to retroactively go back and see stuff. The, yeah. the, the irony of how difficult it is for us to see a movie once it has come out is kind of strange. <laughs> yeah. um, just by nature of us having other appointments and we had the Dune junket all weekend. It was really tough for me to, to get back. I promise I will be getting to a theater and paying to go see it, which I'm very excited about to contribute you, they, you to You live movie. across the street from one. It's literally Exactly. All the more reason your... why I should tell you why it was difficult for me to, yeah. to get over there and do that. That being said, here would be my list in which Shang-Chi would have to beat one of these in order to make my top eight. Okay. Um, my number one is Infinity War. Doesn't need to be said why. Uh, Civil no. War is number two. Uh, mm. Thor Ragnarok, number three. Guardians at number four. Spider-Man Homecoming at number five. Winter Soldier at number six. Uh, the original Avengers at seven. And Doctor Strange at eight. Okay. We're, we're not that far off. No. We're, I, got, really I, gotta, I, I gotta respect the Infinity War at number one. Uh, just because it's... It, it, I, I, was, I was making my list and I'm just like... It's so interesting because Winter Soldier, I just have I have a love for what that movie did for me in the MCU. Sure. But Infinity War is like Infinity War is one of the greatest movies I've ever yeah. seen. It's it's perfect. Infinity it's War, perfect what, movie. It's one thing it like to to love a movie uh, and and uh, remember the experience. It's another thing to want to see other people having that experience because because mm-hmm. we all saw it in advance. And then I went with the girl I was seeing opening weekend that Friday night, and I was so excited not to see it again. But to see other people see it. Oh yeah. That, that's how you know you love a movie when you just want to see other people's reaction to it. I went same reason I went a thousand times for Dark Knight is I just wanted to see everyone's reaction to the train flip or train the the truck flip. And, truck flip. Yeah, that's that when when it's a shared communal experience. That's that's cinema, baby. Well, funny speak- enough, Sean and I were talking talk about this sometimes. I, I I had fun going to the theaters to watch people react to Breaking Dawn Part Two, and that yeah. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily a great movie, but that shocking twist was one of the coolest audience reactions i've ever seen with what the director did on that movie oh, also insane. there was a man um who had waited forever to see uh star wars the rise of skywalker 
and then we ruined his opportunity <laughs> to enjoy a movie he'd waited 40 years for. We ruined his childhood. But that's uh, neither here nor there. Hey, don't say we. Y'all. <laughs> Y'all ruined his childhood. There is a, another Jake film Hamilton did no such thing. That is uh, collectively adored, and it is turning 10 years old uh, this year, somewhat recently. And so in honor of that, Gavin O'Connor started to do some press to celebrate Warrior. And it's kind of ridiculous to talk about the fact that it's weird. Like, I think Warrior is a little bit of an under-the-radar film. It wasn't a huge breakout hit. He'll talk about this in the interview. Um, but it has quietly and steadily over the past 10 years found its audience. I think it's now very much, you know, I'm not even going to say like a cult film. I just think it's an, a, a beloved sports film at this point. But when you talk about the fact that the leads are Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton, you know, it's ridiculous now how mm. I think if they had just like... They should just put it back in theaters and yeah. like pretend it's new. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, I feel like every yeah. couple of months they put an old movie that bombed on Netflix yeah. and, every, and all of a sudden it does massive numbers. Everyone's like, have you seen this movie? I'm like, yeah, 15 years ago when it yeah. came out. But right. sometimes people just don't, we forget people sometimes don't know every single movie that comes out. I know. But this That's one's true. special. This one you guys really should know. And so we were thrilled to get Gavin O'Connor on Real Blend talking about Warrior. And so uh, without further ado, our conversation with Gavin O'Connor. Uh, Gavin, welcome back to the Rule Blend podcast, man. It's so good to see you again. Uh, it's so funny. Whenever we talked to you for way back, we were all excited to try to squeeze in warrior questions. So it's nice to be able to just flat out ask them without <laughs> having to squeeze them in at the end. Um, I, I do want to flash again. back. Uh, it's so good to see you. Um, I want to flash back 10 years, and I want to go to the opening weekend uh, of Warrior. <laughs> When the weekend numbers weren't what you wanted them to be, what you thought they were going to be, but the reviews were were phenomenal. I'm just sort of curious what sort of headspace you're in by that Sunday night, and and what had you heard from the studio? What what word were you hearing from the studio? So, um, look, this is so we'll have an honest conversation, and there's um, there's good and bad inside of this. So. So here's the truth. I was begging them to pl- platform the movie, a uh, hundred screens, mm. trust that we'll get good word of mouth. No one knew, I mean, you know, now people, no one knew Tommy and, I mean, no, as I always say, I go, there's not one person on my block where I grew up that knows who Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton. Right. And, and they all know Nick Nolte and probably don't give a shit anymore. So that's kind of like, you know, Nick wasn't putting people in the seats brilliant actor, but that's just the truth. So I was really begging for um, platform and they wanted to go all out. So there was a lot of this going on. When I say I'm right, I don't know. Look, they also spent $30 million on a movie with two unknown actors and no one else would do that. So I give them all the credit in the world for big stones and balls to do it. Mm -hmm. But I was heartbroken. I was in New York on the Friday it opened I flew back that day, back to LA. The National, the band The National were playing that Friday night um, at, uh, no, I'm sorry, they were playing that Saturday night. I flew back Friday night. The National was playing at the Hollywood Bowl that Saturday night. My wife and I went to the bowl. I had a broken heart already because I knew the numbers Friday night and you just know. And I knew how much P&A the spend was. And I remember going to the bowl and a friend of mine was there. He was like, oh, you know, he was all excited. The movie's opening and this and that. He's hugging me. I'm like, I remember saying, oh, dude, it's over. He said, what do you mean it's over? I said, it's over. All that work, all that passion, everything we put. I said, it's over. Like, we're going to be, we're just going to watch it go just fucking implode. So um, thank you for breaking my heart on the opening question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wanted to get it out of the way. Well, wait to that well, end. Only go this way now. Yeah. To that yeah. end, I want to follow up because now yeah. you've had you've had both experiences. You've had a movie open number one at the box office with the accountant, and you've had a film like this that has grown in stature and respect uh, to the point where we were joking earlier that we can't mention this film to anyone else without them saying to us. Oh, I fucking love that movie. That movie is fantastic. So which one's more rewarding? Is it, is it the, the oomph of a win or is it to hear 10 years later that this film you put that much effort into is still beloved? It's no question the latter because what happened was the movie found um, a second life 10 years ago. It was, it was DVDs and then eventually Peacock. 
Um, so um, it, it found it, so that was you know really gratifying, and, and I knew you know I would feel it from people. I, well, I remember going to the accountant premiere in London, and all anyone would talk about was the warrior over there. It was I was like, oh my god, wow. this is crazy. So the, the latter definitely, but just in the moment because I knew it was over. I just had such high expectations. Not that I don't you know whatever the movies do what they do, but. I just poured so much into the film. It was so a part of my, you know, there was so much in that movie that was just my life. You know, that was just my life. My brother and I was split up. I went with my dad, my brother went with my, my mom. My dad was an alcoholic. Sports were a big part of my life because I needed, it was a, I, that was my way of guaranteeing to see my, to spend time with my father. Even though I had this artistic thing inside of me that I wanted to do, but I was good at sports and, and I knew my dad would be with me and I'd get love. So all that kind of childhood trauma that I experienced and, you know, I guess issues I was trying to work out, I poured into the script. So mm. it, I, I wasn't ready to let it go. And it was just kind of just, it just was dead. So that was why it was hard. Gavin, you mentioned something interesting in, in the first answer that Jake was asking you about, about Nick Nolte not putting people in the seats at, at that time. Um, and I feel, I had this discussion a lot with the guys about the age of the movie star, right? And the idea of the movie star bringing people back to the box office. And there's really only a few names that I can think of outside of like superhero films and franchises that could still bring people to the box office. And I think maybe DiCaprio and Denzel, there's a lot, there's a few names I think that do that. In, as somebody who's worked in the business for as long as you have, and we, we've kind of seen that shift happen. What are your thoughts on that idea of like selling movies based on the star now? Because like it's the franchises, it's the sequels, it's the superhero movies. And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that just on a general basis as a filmmaker. Well, I feel like back in the day when I started, you had to have, you know, they were always running these algorithms, these kind of mathematical equations of people like, the overseas what people were i don't think i'm like wait someone's worth x amount of dollars in like paraguay like what does that even mean but they had all these so you were always trying to figure out how do you cast your movie that you're honoring kind of the artistic integrity of it and not selling out with an actor because that actor gets it made i feel like now it's not that i've done streaming movies or i think i'm probably going to end up doing it i resisted it but you know they're they're less concerned with that their whole business models are you know are different so um, and I haven't done a superhero movie, so I don't really know. I don't really know how. Do, do you need movie stars for suit? I guess you do, right? Do you need movie? I mean, they they have movie stars, but it's almost like you look at someone like Tom Cruise, who has a hard time opening a film by himself that's outside of a Mission Impossible film. And I just find that to be interesting because like those stars were so bankable, but I feel like we're not in that time period anymore. No, you're, yeah, exactly. It's a weird. It's so. It's moving like. It feels like everything's moving in slow motion and at the speed of light, kind of simultaneously, <laughs> our business is it's like, it's just fucking weird. It's true. And, I, you know, now, you know, when I look at my daughter watching a movie on her phone, it's maddening. It's maddening. I'm trying to explain. Do you realize that this was not meant to be viewed this way? Like, right? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, and her I father's thought. a director. <laughs> <laughs> that would Matt. I don't have kids, but that would make me upset too if I saw some kid watching a movie on his on their phone. It would. I know, but it's the way of the world now, man. On her computer, she just watches. I mean, it's really, we have a fucking big. She's like, no, I'm not going to watch on my computer. I'm like, yeah, in the background. It's in the background while they're doing other <laughs> oh, stuff. You know, <laughs> I have two kids. Yes, you I know. Not paying attention. Yeah, you know. I know all too well. <laughs> You know yes. all too well. And you want to go, there's something about like quiet. If you actually allow just everything to be quiet and not a background noise, you can maybe be thinking about things outside of what you're hearing and what's on your telephone. Yes. Right? This is true. This is but true. It's a whole new, it's a brave new world. Not that the this movie needs a sequel. It certainly doesn't. Um, however, revisiting it, I've realized that you have three extremely fascinating characters that were you to revisit them, you know, I would love to know what they're up to. Maybe this is a ludicrous question because, you know, you didn't think that the movie succeeded out of the bat, but have you ever considered going back and just getting back into the headspaces of those characters? Yeah, so uh, I've had conversations a couple of years ago with Joel and Tommy. Um, and they were both like said, look, if you can come up with the story, we're in. I, I was never able to crack a story that I felt like was better than what I did. Mm. 
And I, and I, you know, like I had a couple, like I knew I didn't want to have, you know, one brother in the other brother's corner. He's co- he's now the corner co- coaching, helping him with his other, I was, he was never doing that. I just never figured out a better movie and I just didn't want to pollute. I didn't want to pollute it with something that felt less than. So I never went there, but what I, so, but here's what I am doing now, um, which has just happened. Um, I closed the deal a couple of weeks ago with Lionsgate to do it as I'm going to do a TV series called warriors with it plural. Mm -hmm. The it's the spirit of the movie. None of the Conlon, none of the none of the characters from the movie, but the spirit of the movie and the DNA and the and the DNA of the movie. Meaning, you know, I'm going to deal with social issues that are important to me, as I was doing back then with the recession and you know the one-two punch of a recession and 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 um and the sort of military fucking shell game that was going on, mm-hmm. and um and uh and 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 and, and, and the movie and the show is going to be about. So we're going to follow four characters every season. Glo- this is a global show. So, I'm, so the first season, I have a, an Irish, and they're all fighters, and they're going to get into a tournament called Sparta. So that's the one thing that is they're smart. Wait, dramatic? Like it's it's right. going to be written, or it's a yeah, real it's reality? No, no, it's real. It's real. I'm going to write oh, wow. it. Oh, wow. It's a narrative, fictional narrative TV series about okay. four fighters. Mm-hmm. So there's a fight, and, and the social issues I'm going to explore are going to be uh, incarceration, mental health, uh, poverty, uh, self-worth, self-esteem, self-love, um, two men, two women. So there's a women's tournament. Right. They'll be anointing the queen of Sparta and the king of Sparta. But the show's about the fight outside, like my movie, the, fo- the show's about the fight outside the cage. Everyone has, I, I truly believe we all have a life fight. We're all fighting for something in life. And whatever, so, so that's what I'm, I'm creating a series where we follow four characters outside the cage in the drama of their lives. What are they fighting for? And then we will get them into a tournament. And then the other part of the DNA of my movie, which will be, I'm going to get you invested in characters and then they will be facing each other. That's the outstanding. Wow. Gavin, do you know when we're going to get to see that? Well, I just closed the deal with Lionsgate. So now uh, we're going to take it out to streamers and I have to sell it. So, you know, go do that whole thing, the dog and pony show, selling a show. But if I do, which I hope, then that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to write them and direct them. I'm going to do all of them. And, and, then, and then if it goes well, then the second season, I'll have a character in China, I'll have a character in Africa, I'll have a character in Brazil. You know what I mean? So it's a global show and it's a universal show because as humans, we're all going through the same fucking things. And, and then the wish fulfillment of it is that you, these characters get to fight for the thing that they're believing in inside of a case to win a lot of money if they win. The trick to the show is I kept telling Lionsgate is, you know, in the first season, not everyone's going to win. Mm. But you have to how, – what's the win outside the case? That's what has to be the most satisfying. What's the win outside right. if they lose inside? And I've cracked all that. So I'm very excited about it. And that's going to – so that's the – kind of the direction I'm taking the whatever the brand or whatever the way I'm calling it. Gavin, you know the legendary story about Jim Cameron, right? About no. with a- Alien and Aliens, where he went in to pitch Aliens as the sequel, and he no. wrote Alien on a whiteboard really big, and then he put Aliens, and he made a dollar sign with the S. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna steal that. Please do yeah. that. Please do. That Please. was the first thing I thought of whenever he said warrior. I was like, oh, you're gonna dollar sign. Just right, go into the board, put warrior. Wait a second, make it warriors. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Sold. Can you call uh, James you'll, Cameron you'll get, up you'll to have get, it? You'll get your commission on this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it worked that. for him. It, it worked really well for him. That's yeah. good. I'm using that. That's great, man. Thank you. We're gonna start uh, seeing like every sequel, like the accountants, like every like six months we're gonna see yeah. No Way Backs and then you know, Christian. The Miracles. There will, not, there, yeah. there will not be a Way Back sequel, but we are doing an accountant sequel. We literally just closed that deal. Well, oh my God, really? Doing the accountant again, yeah. So that uh, is, as, is Affleck coming back for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want, I've always wanted to do three because what the second one's gonna be more with, you know, so now we're gonna integrate his brother into the story. Oh yeah, and 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 and, and that, so he'll there'll be more screen time for Bernthal in the second one, and then the third movie is going to be I call it Rain Man on Steroids. The third movie is going to be the two brothers, these two 
these two, uh, this odd couple. If the third movie is going to be a buddy picture. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So you got to call awesome. it the accountant colon warrior. <laughs> <laughs> to the two brothers. <laughs> in fact. You know, the Gavin, would be the accountants with two S's and we just put yeah, a couple it, of them. It just keeps like every, just a bunch of dollar signs after. <laughs> <laughs> that works well with the dollar sign. Yeah. Uh, I was curious. I was curious, uh, Gavin. In terms of like your filmmaking over the years, if you look at like all the movies you made, I believe the first digital film you shot may have been The Way Back on digital. I, I could be wrong on that, but the majority of your films right. were shot on thirty five. Right. When, when I right. watched Warriors, one of my favorite movies of all time, the the thirty five millimeters, it's so timeless. Like it just looks like a film, and it's gorgeous. Uh, and I was just curious in terms of like what film meant to you in your career, and then the decision to go to digital on the way back and kind of what that transition was like for you. And uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it was painful. It was really painful. But what I discovered was um, that uh, as I, what I did on the way back, I said, if, 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 if you can convince me that I can shoot digitally and make it look like film, meaning giving it this kind of three-dimensional grainy look, and I can play with grain in a way that, um, will satisfy the, you know this movie then then and and there's a company called Librain that does that they literally replicate live um, film stock from you know it could be film stock 80 years ago I mean every film stock from all over the world they replicate it so you can take different film stocks that's been replicated digitally play with grain and that was kind of revelatory I mean I, don't, I never heard of anything it's all new technology so that was so that's going to be my new because the thing about digitally is like it was actually on the way back, like we were moving and grooving, man. As you guys know, you can just keep on shooting. And I like to, like, I like to, once we get in a groove, I don't like to cut, let's go again, let's keep playing. So I'll probably shoot digitally again, as long as I can, you know, I can play with grain and things like that and make it feel, I felt like, I felt like, I mean, I had, I had people that actually thought that I shot the way back on film because I it think- It looked like it, it yeah, looked like I mean, it. I hope yeah. so, because I worked really hard to make it look like it was filmic. So, yeah. Uh, Gavin, I picked up on something too, just to follow up on that really quick. Um, I don't think I paid attention to this when I watched Warrior the first time through, but did you do different techniques to shoot Pittsburgh and Philadelphia? Did you use a different film stock or different cameras? Because they, they, it seemed like the Pittsburgh stuff was a little more washed out, a little more grainy. And when you got to the Philadelphia, it at least had a bit of a pop of some color of maybe some life. Yeah, there was a little more vibrancy in the Philadelphia part. I mean, obviously I shot the Philadelphia stuff in Pittsburgh, but I just cheated it for Philly. Oh, really? Uh, That's oh, funny. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you didn't know. We were just in a house on the street or something like that. But, um, uh, try, I mean, I definitely used some different, you know, different film stocks and, and, and um, same camera. I, I don't, I'm trying to remember 10 years ago. With the, <laughs> I mean, I know that, you know, art design, production design, things like that with color in the film, in the, in the visual design of the movie, I was, I was doing that. The, 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 the Pittsburgh, I would always call it working class poetry. That's what I was always going for in the Pittsburgh part of it. Um, yeah, I don't remember. It was 10 years ago. I'm trying to remember the stocks we were using and stuff like it's that. It's beautiful, man. It's really effective either way. Uh, Gavin, speaking of direction, over the last 10 years, Joel Edgerton has emerged yeah. as a really cool director. And you know, he, he does really great, really great work. I'm sort of curious if you noticed any interest from him on set of Warrior 10 years ago. Was he asking you questions? Was he stepping behind the camera? Did you notice then yeah. that he was, he, no? Were you no, but I knew then? he was right. I knew, I mean, he had made short films with his brother Nash, which yeah. I had seen and I'd read some of his stuff, but he did, he's a very good writer. So, but he was way too busy <laughs> to be, he, he was, you know, when he wasn't working, shooting, he was training. Yeah. When he wasn't training, he was shooting. And then I, I don't remember him ever, I have no recollection of that. I never knew that he had aspirations like really to go down the road of be that once because his career take was taking off after the movie as an actor mm -hmm. and then he shifted gears. But I do remember when I saw um, The Gifts. Oh, which is awesome. Oh, right? So that end, that ending. <laughs> oh, oh, I was like, he, yeah, I went to see it. I mean, I saw several incarnations of the movie and I was like, dude, <laughs> like you hit it, you hit it out of the park, brother. Like really, yeah. really good movie, and yeah. I was really proud of him. He's Joel's the best. Joel's the best. Um, there's a sense of magic to this film, uh, Gavin. In that, no matter how many times I've seen it, I, I go back and rewatch, and I am convinced, absolutely convinced, that Brendan's going to lose every fight. <laughs> I just, I have no idea how he's going to get to the end of him, no matter how many times I've seen the film. 
what is the what what is the technique to that? What is what? How do you put tension in a sports movie so that every time I go back and and rewatch it, there's like there's the, there's a sequence in Back to the Future where Marty has to like get the the DeLorean going and hit the lightning at the same you know at the same time. And every time I watch that sequence, I'm convinced he's not going to make it. Um, <laughs> and it's the same thing with your film. I'm I see who he's facing, and I'm like, nah, he's not going to win this one <laughs> at all. Well, the, you know, the intention was for the two brothers was, as I always said to Tommy, I said, dude, like, you're hitting the crack pipe. You're an addict who's hitting a crack pipe. And once you, it's over. You got high. That's what this is. You're getting high in the cage. For Joel uh, and Brendan, it was about, so you can't measure a man's heart. So everyone you're going to be facing is bigger than you, stronger than you, better than you, more talented than you, has more experience, like everything. But he doesn't have a bigger heart than you. Oh. He doesn't have he doesn't have as much desire as you. Because I really because in fighting, like, you know, fucking heart is a lot of it. Is it is how is how much you want it? So so th- that was just like sort of a doorway into how to approach the scenes. And then after that, like I don't know, man. Like I, I'm always trying to tell stories inside of the action. Like, that's why, like, there was no second unit shooting action and stuff like that, because it's like inside of the action, I'm always trying to establish an emotional line with the person that, you, that you're fighting. Mm-hmm. And what's the story points that I can keep advancing? That's what I was always trying to go for. So I think that there's an emotionality to that if you're hooked into the characters and, you know, whether, you know, so that, you know, whether it's, you know, Brendan fighting and looking at his wife, Brendan in the corner with his you know, obviously Brendan and Tommy, that was an easy one because sure, sure. they were unearthing all their childhood trauma. Everything that was going on in their lives was happening. And, they were, you know, all those years of everything was worked out in five rounds until, you know, he had to get his brother to, you know, he had to slay his brother. He had to, you know, I always call the movie an intervention in a cage where one brother beats the shit out of the other brother and gets him to die and be reborn and all coming from a place of love. Right. Which mm-hmm. sounds crazy to like when you say it, it sounds a little crazy, but that was the goal. Hmm. You know, Gavin, I've always been curious about this. I've, I've asked actors this a lot in terms of like when you see younger photos of them in a film, like from their childhood, it's actually pictures from their own real childhood. And I remember at the junket for this film, I asked Joel Edgerton and Tom Hardy if those photos were in fact them at a younger age. And Joel said, yes, my mom sent a bunch of them in. And then Tom said, no, my mom refuses to actually send in childhood photos of me. So I was just curious from your perspective, what your view on that was in terms of like, did you have to find just a younger kid who kind of looked like Tom Hardy at a young age? What, what, was that something you were even involved in? Or was that something in terms of like set decoration? No, I was involved in it. I was like, I mean, why won't your mom send the picture? <laughs> right. I was wondering the same thing. Really? We can make do. Forget about like really your mom like you may want to work that one out dude like really <laughs> are you an adult <laughs> uh, you know so I don't know but that's between them but we ended up what what ended up happening also was the you know there was a fighter I can't remember his name but there was a kid in Pittsburgh who was this great high school wrestler so you watch when Brent when when Patty's watching his son obviously that's not Tommy as a young boy. Mm-hmm. That was, I can't remember this kid's name. It's been 10 years, but he was a great high school wrestler. So I ended up getting pictures of him when I needed him. He was, he looked kind of like Tommy, a blonde hair. And that's what I ended up doing. That's cool. Wow. Thank you. I was just curious yeah. about that. Thank wow. you. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> Gavin, I, I love that we live in a world where Nick Nolte got an Oscar nomination for this film. Yeah. Uh, I remember when they announced his name for supporting actor. And there's just a part of me that like, even though like it doesn't, reward me at all that i kind of felt like <laughs> cool like i kind of felt like i because i like i was a part of it because i've been a champion of this film and i wanted to do well and it made me feel good do you remember the moment that you heard nick nolte got an oscar nomination and i'm just sort of curious what that meant for you personally yeah it was really validating uh you know i, I you know nick you know and, and i give the studio credit once again i had two unknown actors a 30 million dollar movie with two unknown actors so you know my, my my attorney kept going to me how the fuck is this happening like this is a mural <laughs> and then when i wanted to put nick in no pun intended sorry <laughs> <laughs> you know, nick wasn't you know back in those 10 years ago nick wasn't putting anybody in the seats i mean he was you know he was a bit of a dinosaur it's a great actor but not you know, whatever the algorithms are overseas, I kept hearing doesn't have value and all this other stuff. But um, 
you know, I wrote the part for Nick. It was always Nick. Nick's the first person to read the script when we finished it before the studio. I gave it to Nick. Mm. I was doing bio- biographical work with Nick because we lived near each other for years um, before we even had a deal for Nick to be in the movie. Like, mm. you know, he would say to me, oh, God damn it, why, 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 what am I doing to get there? Are you trying to get this movie out? And I was like, dude, I promise you, you're going to do the movie. Let's just keep doing the work. Ryan kid's going to agree. They're not there yet because they're already trying to figure out how to do this movie with two unknowns. And now, you know, I'm trying to jam you in. And then, you know, to look to Lionsgate's credit, man, they said yes. And they were really cool about it. No other studio was letting me make that movie the way I wanted to make it at that price, which was Nulty and two unknowns. But back then, these guys were unknowns. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so a lot of credit to Lionsgate for that. I want to drill down a little bit more on uh, Nulty just for this reason, um, because rewatching this film, and as I mentioned earlier, I have two boys myself now, um, I, I watched a different movie, and I know the movie is exactly the same. I, we make this joke on the show all the time, is that movies don't change, but we do. Um, <laughs> and I'm a different person 10 years later. So yeah. now these little emotional beats with Nulty, you know, they break my Wait, heart. How, how old, uh, Sean, how old are your kids? They are 17 and 13. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not quite in a cage yet, but I'm I'm grooming them. <laughs> I'm grooming them. Um, but uh, and 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 he's mean. Hardy's mean to him. Like it's it's it really cuts to the bone. But I I wanted to ask you if if you could think of a movie that that it's the same exact movie, but when you caught up with it years later, you realized like, oh my god, I I watched this through different eyes. God, that's a, I don't, that's a really good question. Yeah, think about that. I put you on the spot. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, it's a great, it's like a really interesting, like philosophical question to ask about, you know, time. And um, I certainly, you know, I mean, you know, part of me is thinking like, have I not changed in 10 years? (laughs) I guarantee you have. have. Um, Obviously, you know, we're all evolving and everything. I don't know. I got to think about that, Sean. I don't know. I'm not really, I don't really know. That's okay. You know, I don't really know. Well, I thank you for helping me with this because yeah, okay. <laughs> I love it. It's rewarding. Well, while while you are thinking about that, I'll, I'll, I'm only have a couple minutes left. Um, yeah. There's something I've always fascinated with in terms of fighting, in terms of movies, because um, movies are shot out of order. And I would imagine you shoot your fight sequences. Uh, I would imagine non-linearly, but I'm, maybe you try to shoot them in, in as, or, as much order as possible. But fight continuity, sweat continuity injury continuity has got to be an incredible thing to like have to navigate while you're shooting a movie that to make sure the sweat's still in the same spot when we cut to the close-up or the long shot can you talk about that that challenge as a filmmaker when you're in the middle of shooting a fight scene yeah well so specifically for warrior the intention was uh to i shot i I saved the tournament for the end of the movie that was the last whatever couple of weeks of shooting for a number of reasons a if I shot her early and someone got hurt, yeah, I have an injury on my hands. So that was going to be problematic. So, so that was just a production decision. But also, I wanted to be happy. Like when, when Tommy wasn't working, he was, work, he was training and he was doing his choreography. When Joel was, and remember, those guys don't fight each other until the end. So there was a lot, there was other things I had to do. When Joel wasn't working, he was training and doing his choreography. Um, so that's what was happening until we got to the tournament. And then at the tournament, we were just locked in every day shooting this thing without any distractions. I wasn't doing anything else. It was just a tournament. So my entire focus was on the characters inside the cage, the characters not only fighting, but the characters, you know, in the corners with the coat with Tommy and having, but with, you know, Brandon and Frank. Um, and, uh, so that wasn't a problem because it really, and I tried to, I kept it as much in order as I can. I shot it round by round. I wasn't shooting rounds out of order. I kept it as linear as I can. Pretty much the whole tournament I kept that way. I waited till the end to shoot the five rounds with the brothers. That was the last thing I shot with them. So not that it was easy because you're dealing with fighting and choreography and getting all that right. And look, there was times when they were really hitting each other. It got at times pretty intense, but the continuity of it wasn't didn't feel that challenging because of the way we structured it. Hmm. Gavin, I'll wrap you on this. I uh, used an expression earlier in the interview that, that coincides with, with what I feel about sports movies. You said you, you referred to the win outside the cage. Yeah. And I've always felt like 
the best sports movies oftentimes really have nothing to do with sports whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a bit of a chicken or the egg question for you. When you're developing a great sports film, do you sort of develop the drama first and then find sort of the sports sequences to match it? Or do you develop the sports sequences and then say, okay, what drama can I come up with to give weight to this, to these sports sequences? Yeah. Well, um, look, miracle was what, what it was. So like I was taking a true yeah. story and, um, but, but with warrior, um, with warrior, I, can you rephrase that question for me? Just uh, what I guess. What do you do? What do you concern yourself with first as a storyteller? Do you concern yeah, yourself with it, the it's, drama? It's, but, I mean, yes, it is. But like with work, like yes, one hundred percent. It's all. It's everything. It's everything outside the cage. But I did have I'm, the reason. I, there were two things kind of like happening simultaneously for me. I was trying to because I had done miracle. Mm-hmm. And look at any sports movie. When when Rocky starts, who who are we rooting for? We're not rooting for Creed, right, right, right. right. So you know who we're rooting. And Miracle, you know who you're rooting for, right? And I don't know the like. So that's the most of the. By the way, Rocky is a failure if Rocky wins the fight. Yeah, mm-hmm. true. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 the it's the personal journey that he yeah. needed to accomplish, right? So that's why that movie works. So. So the reason I, I'm trying to I'm trying to answer the question because it's a it's actually it's a provocative question. The drama was the story I had worked out vis-a-vis the two brothers, the 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 schism that happened inside the family, the alcoholism, all the trauma, things like that, which was a lot of my own life. So that was that. I knew I was going to do it, but I also knew on the on the on the fighting side of the movie i knew that i wanted to challenge the audience to understand both of these guys get hooked into the emotional storyline of both of these guys understand the stakes of their lives and know that okay they're going to face there's a collision course happening here and i want to challenge you as an audience member now to go okay now what who are you rooting yeah. for now Right. And I had not seen that in a sports movie because I was definitely, because I had done one, I was very intentionally trying to bend the genre in a way that felt unique and original because you're always hooked into the, what, pick a sports movie, you know who you're rooting for out of the game. So sure. I wanted, so that was very intentional. So I had kind of had two trains running to answer the question. I had, I had two trains running. It was, it was all about the drama, but I knew, I knew what I, I, I didn't know the other fights, but I knew the two brothers were going to be having this intervention in a cage. And I knew the song that was going to play while I was writing it. I knew that about today was going to be the song in the fifth round. That was, I always had that in my head. And, um, and I was hoping to be able to um, bring a, 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 like a, a tonality to that final fight that was very different than all the other fights in the movie because you know who you're rooting for in the other fights. Sure. And then the goal was once it's over, because yeah, once it's over, it to, for the audience to go, that was the right ending. Yeah. Surprising, surprising yet inevitable. The right. bro- Tommy had to die at the hands of his brother, I say spiritually, to right. be reborn. Like that's the when you that had to be the ending. Though so my goal was you wouldn't think that until it happened. That was my goal. Well, so, guess mm. what? Yeah, it worked. <laughs> it, it worked. It worked. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, but that's, yeah, a great, that, that, that's a that's a that's a really cool question, Jake. I had to really because yeah, because it's like you're always, it's always a drama. But that was it was always about how do you make this thing work at the end? And then once you do that and you start reverse engineering, you go mm-hmm. okay. So what are these little things we can do to make sure this has this kind of uh, impact when we reach the finale? That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, Gavin, again, we're tremendous fans of, of this film. We're tremendous fans of you and your body of work. Uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on Real Blind Man and taking the time. Continued success. Hopefully we get you back for the next movie. As as I said last time, always I was happy when I saw the email that you got that I was going to be doing this with you guys. So um, I, I really, truly respect what you guys do and truly, truly grateful that we're even having this conversation. Like with all, like I, I, I truly am. So in all, in all, um, and love and gratitude. I'm, I'm, I just want to thank you guys to, to, to bring this back and allow me to talk about it 10 years later. It's surprising and overwhelming in a lot of ways. And um, 
So I, I thank you guys. Anytime, man. Appreciate thank it. You, thank you, Gavin. You well. Stay safe buddy. out there, man. Yes, yeah. yeah. you too. You too. Thank you. you too. All right. Bye-bye. We want to thank Lionsgate for giving us time with Gavin O'Connor. You guys need to really catch up with Warrior. I, the, revisiting it uh, for the purpose of this interview, there's the element of it that strikes me is Tom Hardy's a monster in that movie. Like he is, he's incredibly mean to uh, his father, played by um, Nick Nolte. And then the thing that he does at the end of every fight, I don't know if you guys remember, like he doesn't wait for the fight to be called. The minute he knocks a guy down, he just slams open the gate and storms out of the ring every time. It's a tremendous mic drop moment uh, for him in that movie. So uh, movie's coming back out. Everybody's going to get a chance to see it in celebration of the 10th anniversary of Warrior on September 9th. I want to let you guys know that there's going to be a price drop on Apple TV that will begin on Tuesday, September 7th, which will give you an opportunity if you have Apple TV to catch back up with that movie and check it out. Yeah, I mean, honestly, just if Warrior, any of our audience members, if you haven't seen it, it is it, it's one of the greatest sports movies ever made. And it's genuinely a brilliant emotional experience. Like you will just feel so damn good at the end of it. Like it's it's just a it's a rush, man. I, I, I love seeing that film in theaters. And I find that anytime I bring it up to anyone, you can almost see it click in their minds when then they go like, they remember they love that movie. There's always like a beat yeah. and they go, oh yeah, oh my God. Oh my yeah. God, I love that movie. We had Joel Edgerton come in studio one time and he's one of those actors that like everyone loves him in something different. Um, but I must have had multiple people come up and just go, oh my God, from Warrior. Oh my God, I love Warrior. And I'm like, you know, that movie would have done a hundred million dollars to the box office if every single one of you had gone to the theaters yeah. to see it. Speaking yeah. as someone who did not pay to go see it because I saw it at the junket, the rest of you should have paid to go see it. <laughs> you know what's funny, though? We got to play that game with the director of Warrior. Because we were like, dude, how yeah. about Joel Edgerton? And he was like, oh, The Gift. Yeah. So the guy who directs Warrior yeah. says The Gift. Yeah. Everyone else says Warrior. Yeah. Uh, the Gift is an incredible film, by the way. Like, he directed yes. the hell out of that. Edgerton did, yeah. Make sure you check that out as well. All right, let's get to talking points and discuss Michael K. Williams' passing, uh, a tragic note that happened just a couple of days before we started recording this episode, and um, one that really, really hurt, really shocked us all, uh, because he was so young, 54 years of age, and um, I believe they're still investigating it, but the cause of death is believed to be uh, an overdose of heroin he was found in his apartment. Um, Kevin had just recently interviewed him. It was a year ago uh, for yeah. it was for um, Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country. Country. So, and yeah. I know you wanted to speak a little bit about that that experience, and then we we're going to talk a bit about his his career. Yeah, no, I mean, I just think he's one of the greatest actors that was working today. I mean, he uh, I've interviewed him a few times over the years, and every time I talk to him, I just got a, I got a sense that craft meant so much to him, and, and, and yeah, he. He just cared so much about the work and everything he's done from The Wire. And, and it's funny, I, I haven't watched The Wire all the way through, but I've seen the first one or two seasons um, sporadically all the way through and just like in chunks. And the the performance from uh, as Omar is just it's an incredible performance. That character is such a pivotal part of that series. I do. I really want to finish The Wire. I, I, I just haven't had a chance to. I'm still finishing Lost at the moment. But um, but it, he's just an amazing actor. Boardwalk Empire, obviously. Uh, but throughout the years, you know, interviewing him for Lovecraft Country was last year and um, getting to talk to him about his childhood and just kind of what that movie meant, or that show meant to him. And then obviously what The Wire meant to him, um, his thoughts on The Wire uh, considering how long ago it came out and kind of what it means to him now, we're just fascinating to hear. And, and he just, he, every time I would ask him a question, he gave such a great answer. Like he actually cared to answer it. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're talking to somebody in press and you feel like they're just kind of like on in robotic mode. He, I felt like he was always locked in and I, I've sat down across from him um, a few times. And then also this was just a zoom interview for Lovecraft country. But, you know, it, I, I, to be honest with you, We've interviewed actors who have passed away before, but this one, for some reason, was just devastatingly shocking to me from a I mean, I just talked to him a year ago over mm -hmm. Zoom. He seemed like he was in great spirits. Um, you know, again, we don't know a ton about what happened, but, you know, it was over Zoom. He was in his home when I talked to him. Um, we were just laughing. Uh, you know, he told me about his sister buying him these chairs for his home. And I mean, it was just a, it's just weird to me. I went back and watched the video today. And I just, it, it, I just can't believe he's gone. I, I can't believe it. And I, yeah. and I just, I just want to say that he's a, he was, one, he is, and still is. I would argue, um, one of the greatest actors working today. Um, his work will live on forever. 
through the medium of, of, of watching his work through the shows. I am now going to make it a point to finish The Wire um, just because I just want to I want to celebrate that show and talk about that show and 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 take it all in because I, I have not given that show the the amount of time I, I it needs. And, and his performance from what I've seen on the show is outstanding. And I know that character was very pivotal and very important for that show. Um, so I just uh, just 54 years old. He was just way too damn young. Yeah, the thing that um, stands out to me about him is that he was an actor who, whenever he showed up in something, you automatically, and that gets said so often, right? But mm-hmm. he wasn't like a leading man yet mm-hmm. at this point. He hadn't, didn't have a, uh, a project that I think you'd point at him and say like, oh, that, that was his movie per se. Um, but he was pivotal to so many, uh, to me, to me, television shows. I associate him with television shows, even though he had a, a strong role in a number of um of good films and uh it was uh alan seppenwall the tv writer who said he would have to be on a mount rushmore of just hbo contributors because of the work that he did on those films the thing about omar i mean i have to talk about omar uh, because i think that is his most significant role is yeah. that it was prior to him getting huge. introduced well prior to him getting introduced in that show that show set up each of the characters as being incredibly hardened for different reasons the cops were completely burned out because of the amount of crime they had to put up with all the drug dealers who you were meeting on the streets of baltimore like just baltimore itself was being painted as one of the most dangerous places where nobody wanted to be and then they introduced this character of omar who everybody was scared of mm. and you were like how the fuck is it possible that every hard ass that we just met over the course of these episodes is scared of this yeah. dude omar's and, coming and he played him so <laughs> so subtle Perfectly. you know and and with this flair that you had to realize that like he's got to be a psychopath if everybody is that scared of him kind of thing um and i watched a clip that wendell pierce uh, who played bunk on the show singled out and he said like mm-hmm. this is the scene that i'll always remember and it was the two of them sitting on a bench talking about bunk was a cop bunk is a cop and omar's obviously a, a lead criminal in the in baltimore and how bunk is saying like hey man I know who you are. Like we grew up in the neighborhood at the exact same time. I was a little bit older than you were, but you remember how this neighborhood used to be, you know, and they were really tough guys, like tougher than who you think you are kind of thing. And, you know, I went to a party with them once because my father kept me on the straight and narrow uh, and wanted me to do right by everything. But I went to a party with one of those guys uh, with all those hard asses. And they said to me, hey, man, you don't belong here, you know? And he goes, I didn't realize till much later what they were doing for me. Like they were keeping me out of all the bad stuff. And he said, Wendell Pierce, the actor said, they brought so much reality to just that conversation. You know, they wanted that conversation to reflect a lot of these really tough choices that people have uh, in Baltimore. Like, do I go in with a bad crowd and maybe throw my life away? Do I stay on the straight and narrow, potentially become a cop? And the way that Michael K. Williams and the way that Wendell Pierce played this, like, I just think, I, like Kevin was saying, they just bring so much realism and so much humanity uh to their performances the other one i want to single out was he was on community he was one of the guest stars on community who played one of the professors and it showed just how funny he could be mm-hmm. too like i mean the dude was so versatile and uh and he's one of those characters that um i'm just going to completely miss popping up and stuff where i'll be like oh good michael k williams is in this it's going to be it's going to be better and you're right yeah. when he showed up on screen it was almost like Oh, I'm about to get a, an amazing performance. Like yeah. I, it was, it was instantaneous. Like he never half-assed anything. It was like full on. Like I, if I saw him show up in a movie, I think he, Brooklyn's finest. Remember Brooklyn's finest? Yeah, yeah. He, he's just, he just a, a scene stopper. He's incredible, incredible. Jake, you already remember? Yeah, him. yeah. I mean, it's it's the equivalent of like a, a kid sleeping in class and a teacher coming over with a ruler and slamming the ruler down on the desk. Like all of a sudden, you jump up and you're like, shit, I should probably pay attention to this um he is you know my, my parents don't know a ton of actors by name aside from like the a-list stars uh but i remember he is an actor that my whenever he would come on screen i've seen my dad go like oh i like that guy i like that guy a lot <laughs> so i mean to the point where i remember you know like like you said sean he's not someone who's maybe like whose name was above the title of a film mm. and i almost would love being surprised whenever he was a part of a project whenever mm. he would pop up you know what you know for for the road and all of a sudden he appears on screen and yeah like if you're if you're slumping down in your chair you, he appears on screen and you know enough about who he is and the roles he takes and the projects he's a part of that you all of a sudden sit up because you know you you know okay well if he's a part of the scene this is going to be good and I should probably <laughs> yes. pay attention to it like he's yeah. he's not someone that you see where like all right this this guy's you know he's 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 not a red shirt 
uh, of acting, you know, uh, to use Star Trek terms. I don't think uh, it's is, exaggerating to put him on like a Philip Seymour Hoffman level. You oh, know? no. He's, Philip I Seymour Hoffman agree showed up in a part. Yeah. You know, he's one of the few people who I was, one of the very few people, like when I saw them, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Here we go. This is going to be fun. All right, let's shift over to uh, Dune reactions. So the three of us have seen Dune, but we all recognize the fact that it doesn't come out till uh, the end of October. And so um, we were lucky enough to see it. It played at Venice and they did the junket out of Venice. So we got a chance to speak to all the actors. You can see Jake's are posted. Kev's yours aren't posted yet, are they? No, Kev's are up. Oh, Kev's are up yeah. there too? Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to have Denise. So I know people have been following us on social media and we can now confirm that we have Denis Villeneuve on the show. And Hashtag it's, uh, it happened. It happened. It's in the can. Um, but we're going to be holding that uh, interview until closer to release. Um, so we're going to have plenty of great stuff coming. There's plenty of really, uh, really good guests coming onto the show. And Denis will be one of them that comes up later. Um, without spoilers. No, and it's weird to say that because the book is decades old and there's an existing version of Dune. So it's not like we're going to give away any major plot spoilers. but um. Uh, Jake, for some people, think, you might though. I think to keep that in mind, for some, there are some people yeah, yeah, that's, who certainly that's have not true. read that long book. Sure. That is very true. Uh, Jakey, why don't you start? Because I think that you um, you might be uh, the one who loved it the most. Yeah, it's it's a it's a five out of five for me. Um, I, I am sort of in awe of what he's able to do, what Denis is able to do in, in two and a half hours. Uh, which I know two and a half hours sounds like a lot of time, but when you think about the complexities that have to just be established, the world and the rules and the religion and the technology that all have to be explained and established so that the events of the film can start taking place. I mean, like everything from the the government to, to what they believe in spiritually to how their armor works. All of these have to be explained to you. There's a reason there's a glossary in the back of Dune. Yeah. All of these things yeah. have to be explained to you so that everything can just start progressing forward. What he is able to do, how he is able to, to use exposition to sort of lay the groundwork for this is the world in which you live. Um, these, these, are the, these are the rules, these are, this is what you need to understand. Okay, let's start moving forward. Uh, how he's able to do that so smoothly uh, is, and then progress the story is, is pretty awe-inspiring. Um, the thing that really stood out for me, um, if I were gonna pick one thing out that really sort of washed over me is, is the scope. Mm -hmm. um, he did an amazing job of really helping me understand how big everything is um, and how small and overwhelming we are compared to the story and compared to the ships and the technology and their universe and, and, the, and, the, and the planet of Arrakis. Um, it really was, it, it makes it all the more scary when you're out in the middle of the desert and or when you're standing next to, you know, a, a sandworm or when you're mm -hmm. standing next to one of their ships, whenever you under, he does such a good job where just the size of it and the, the, the realized scope uh, makes it terrifying in a way. And, and last note that I'll leave on before letting you guys take over is I love how many different genres it is. Like it's a political thriller at one moment and there are some scenes that are shot and felt like a horror film. And there are some scenes that are shot and felt like an, like an awesome action film. And there are some scenes that are shot and felt like a grand scope like adventure. And it was never jarring going from one to the other. It just sort of felt like, hey, if all of these things were happening at one time, it wouldn't just be one general mood that covers up all of the events. Some scenes would feel like a horror film, some more, just like life. Every day is a different, you know, it's not going to be one all-encompassing feeling. So the fact that he was able to lay the groundwork, weave between genres, and give enough of a scope to, to pay tribute to, to what Frank Herbert did within his pages, uh, to me, is pretty awe-inspiring. Well, and one of the things I want to add to it also, too, is that he's coming off of Blade Runner 2049, and I found that Dune um, was way more accessible than Blade Runner 2049 was. And I think Blade Runner 2049 is a masterpiece. Sure. Um, but I also do understand how a general audience would think that he got two in the weeds, right? Like he loves the material. Uh, and so but, I mean, maybe... keep in mind, that's almost like that's his part two. So that would be almost like the equivalent of someone coming watching Dune part two without right. having seen Dune part one. Right. Yeah, very true. Very true. Um, so I, I think that people who um, want something that's a little bit closer to accessible sci-fi because Denis has made some incredibly intelligent 
and heady sci-fi from Arrival to Blade Runner. Um, and uh, even Enemy, I guess Enemy qualifies as science fiction um, in a really bizarre sort of way. Mm-hmm. To me, yeah. what I want to talk about is the cast. I think the cast is perfect. Um, I think everyone is 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 the it, the ideal person for their character and their role. Um, and nobody is typecast in any sort of way. Um, they play versions of people that you can kind of see. And it was kind of fun. I got to talk to Oscar Isaac at the Junket, and I asked him to compare uh, Star Wars and Dune because George Lucas very, you know, has said multiple times that Dune has influenced Star Wars. And then when you think of how different, you know, Duke Leto, who Oscar Isaac plays in Dune is to Poe Dameron, you know, you realize that like Mm -hmm. you could have put Oscar Isaac in the Duncan Idaho role, you know, that Jason Momoa plays and you could have easily put Momoa in a more serious role. Um, So they all play different versions of things that they've played before and they all play it beautifully. Jake's 100 percent right with the scope. Um, It's it's phenomenal. I'm I'm four and a half out of five. Sorry for the YouTube camera. I'm four and a half out of five. I'll get into reasons why it it loses just a, a sliver of a half star for me. Uh, as we get closer to release, but it is one of the best films that you'll see this year. Obviously, Denis is a, a master, an absolute master. I know Kev's going to talk about Zimmer's score. Zimmer's score oh, is, yeah. is is off the charts, unbelievably yeah. great. Within like and, the first uh, two seconds, you're like, "Well, this is one of the best things you've ever done." <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and so it's uh, yeah, it's it's just it's it's top of the line across the board. So. Yeah, I'm I'm at a five out of five. Uh, I, I I that this movie is. A masterclass in immersion. Um, this is pure. I mean, to a point where I, I sat down for the film. I had a, uh, a medium sized popcorn in my in my lap and raisin nets and a, and, a, and, a, and a soda, all ready to devour because I hadn't eaten lunch yet. I was starving. But no, no, I actually did eat lunch. I just wanted popcorn and, and candy. So I went to Kava before. Um, but the movie starts and literally like fifteen seconds into the film, I could not eat my popcorn. I had to put it down because I was so locked in, immersed into the world based on the sound design, score, just everything. Um, he he took me and put me into the mindset and I did not leave for the entirety of the runtime. Um, and that's also that pure... two and a half hours goes like that. I thought yeah. it went incredibly fast. I've first of all, I, I've never seen like the the level of scale and scope in terms of action in this film is beyond words and zimmer's score is one of the best he's ever written in his career and that's saying something yeah. zimmer has written some of the greatest scores of all time and this is different from anything he's ever done yep. this is a the the experience is and i use this term in a good way is brutally immersive like you are just in it you are in the world and the sound design everything about the image greg fraser's cinematography we haven't even seen the imax version yet and denis uh in our interview told us what scenes are going to be in imax and the idea of when you jump to imax it's a punctuation for the audience so i can't wait to see the full scope 1431 aspect ratio imax which is the same aspect ratio that dunkirk and tenant and dark knight and interstellar use when it went to that full square imax scope i can't wait for that because i was already immersed in the 235 which is just the widescreen format when they jump to IMAX, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, it's going it's going to be it was already so immersive to see it the way I saw it. I can't imagine it being even more immersive, which it's going to be, because when you jump to that one, four, three, one aspect ratio for IMAX, you are even more in that world. Um, from performance perspective, I think Jason Momoa's performance is the best thing he's ever done in his entire career. Like this performance, he was designed for this role. Like, the, like it, it, it's such a great performance. And Denis found a way to utilize him in such an emotional and internal way. Skarsgård, that performance. Oh. I, so get this. So I knew I was interviewing Skarsgård for the, for the movie. And prior to going into the film, I didn't know what role Skarsgård played. So it was about two hours into the movie. I didn't look at my watch or anything. I'm just guessing just based on where I was in the story. It wasn't until the two hour or so mark that I realized that that was Stellan Skarsgård playing that character. Wow. Like that guy was that character. I mean, it is truly an incredible performance. Um, Everybody in the film is great. Rebecca Ferguson, Momoa, Chalamet, everybody. Um, It is, like I said, a masterclass in immersion. I, I cannot stress to you enough that if you feel safely to go, that this needs to be seen on the biggest and best screen you could possibly find. This was designed 
to take you into the world. Like you are meant to be there. And that's exactly what he does with sound design, score, effects, cinematography, and performance, costumes. You are in it. And that is the goal of a filmmaker to take you and transport you into a world. And Denis does it in the first 15 seconds of the movie. Like I literally could not eat my popcorn because I, I popcorn didn't exist anymore. I was in the world. <laughs> That's how insane this movie is. There is so, no spoon. There's no spoon. Yeah, I, I, I loved it. And I, I think it's pure cinema on every single level. Like this is this is the type of movie that is made for people, I think, who appreciate what the work that goes into a movie, this movie, I can't imagine making this film. I don't, I, it's so daunting to even think about mm. someone taking on this task. Um, and, and then we also have some things we can discuss once we get closer to release. Um, mm. But my rating is about Dune part one. And that's what I saw. And there's clearly needs to be a part two. And we all want it. We all want to see it. And it needs to happen. Hopefully it'll happen. It's not green lit, but we'll see. Hashtag if it happens. All right, let's yep. get to this weekend movies. Um, and again, Dune comes out October 22nd. So uh, settle in. I, I, don't, way, I hesitate to even mention that it's going to be available on HBO Max, but it'll be available on can, HBO. HBO. Just, just enough time just, for you to read the book, by the way, folks. Can, yeah, can you agree with me on how awesome Momoa is, though? It's no, like it's, the best yeah. thing he's ever done. Sorry, he's, I know we have to he's go. great. Yeah, he's so great. I, I think everyone's great. I honestly think I, I want to get Jake's opinion on um, Paul later uh, when we have time. Because I want to I talk about Timothy and Paul. But we'll get there when we get to the closer to the release. Okay, uh, this week in movies, there's a lot of stuff to get through, including a film called Queen Pins, which I believe stars Kristen Bell and has something to do with bowling. But I don't think anyone's seen it. Has anyone seen it? No, Queen the Pins? movie deals with, it's based on a true story of um, Kristen Bell's character who like clips coupons and then sells them for discounted uh, ways to help people who need them. I I haven't fully seen the film, but I've seen like bits and pieces of the trailer and everything, but it's based oh. on a true story. It uh, it has, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the guy's name from Talk Soup. Um, Joel McHale? Joel, yeah, Joel McHale. Yeah, really? yeah. so there's a, lot, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of good cast members in it, but I haven't fully seen the film yet, but it's based on a true story. Do you know Kristen Bell's favorite Metallica song? Oh, no, come wait on. a second. <laughs> come wait on, it's the easiest one. All along the wait. Kristen Bell Tower? No. That's that's no. Jimi Hendrix. Uh, <laughs> for whom the Kristen Bell tolls. Yeah. <laughs> for whom no, the Kristen, Kristen, the Kristen yeah, Bell that's tolls. Awesome. That's pretty damn good. Come on. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. Uh, get into uh, Jakey Small Engine Repair. I don't even know what this is. Uh, it's really interesting. Oh. It's based on a play. It's basically... Uh, it's basically three guys. There are a couple of other sort of like supporting cast members, but it's three guys. Uh, they're longtime friends who had a falling out. And one day, one of the friends messages out to the other two and says, hey, I need you to come to my, uh, to my small engine repair shop. He's a mechanic. I need you to come to my shop uh, for varying reasons. The reason he draws them into the mechanic shop is uh, a lie. He has, he has an ulterior motive to bring them into the, to the shop because he needs to ask them a favor. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to not go any, I don't know about you, Kevin, like, I think it would be yeah. great to not go any further than that. Um, I, that's, that's all you need to know. Um, Who's but in I it? Really, Anyone we know? Anyone? Uh, Joe, Joe Bernthal, um, uh, Shea Wingham. John from, Bernthal. John, John Bernthal. I'm sorry, yeah, John Bernthal. The lesser uh, known Shea, Joe Shea Wing, Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shea Wingham, <laughs> and then, um, and then the third guy is, is also the director of the film. Um, okay. It, it's based on a play. It's, it's kind of one of those where as you're watching it, you can say, oh, I see how this would have played out on stage. Yeah. I was super into it. Um, the, the resolution of what ends up happening, I wasn't crazy about. But on the flip side, I'm not quite sure what I mean, to, to betray what happened would have, I feel like, betrayed the point. Um, but is, uh, is it but, theaters or streaming? Theaters. Theaters. theaters? OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah, it, I liked it. Like, Kevin, like you liked it as well. Yeah, it's like a powerhouse performance. So a uh, 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 couple of things that are cool about it. Uh, John Polano, uh, who is the director of the film, uh, I, he wrote Stronger. Remember the movie Stronger in 2017? Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. I thought that was great. Yeah. So he's the lead star of this film, and he also directed the movie. Um, okay. And so, and then Bernthal and Shea Wiggum, they play his best friends, as Jake mentioned. Yeah. Uh, they've been friends for decades, um, and... Polano's character basically brings them to his shop, which is like a small engine repair shop um, for a lie, as Jake mentioned, and something kind of crazy goes down. But like casting wise, like Bernthal, Shea Wiggum and John Polano are phenomenal yeah. together. Well, the, like, the two you, Johns played these roles on stage. 
yeah. on Broadway. Oh, it's, that's it's, interesting. It's, it's, it's yeah. a really, like, 10 years ago, right? It was, like, 10 yeah. years ago, I think it was. Um, their performances are absolutely incredible. And, like, it, uh, to be honest with you, like, there's scenes where they're sitting around a dinner table together. You believe that they've been friends for 30 mm. plus years. Like, they, mm. they the way this script kind of, like, interweaves exposition about, like, their backstories. Like, when you first meet them, you don't know a ton about them. And then as the film goes on, you hear stories about when they were in fifth grade or third grade or whatever yeah. it would be. Um, and but with Jake said about the with the with the resolution, it, it's going to I think it's going to tip the hat a little bit to certain people in terms of like where they fall with it. Um, but it's a really intense buildup. And they do a really good job of kind of keeping the intensity. To be honest with you, it, it was funny because we watched I watched this on a screening link and I was walking around my house because I had the, the press junk. And this is not ideal in how I like to watch films. But in, in this day and age, when we have four junkets a day and I'm getting off a morning show, I have to like watch it in between, you know, getting ready to do things. So. It, it was, I loved it so much from the intensity standpoint that I would pick my computer up with me. I'd follow it with me around the house. Again, not ideal way to watch it, but I wanted to see what was going to happen. So at one point today, I was putting away, putting away dishes in my kitchen while finishing the ending of the movie. Um, but um, that's that's just the way I could watch it. Cause did I had to you watch get it burnt all yet? Yeah, yeah we, we did it today. already. Did you ask yeah. him about the accountant part two? I didn't have time, honestly. Ah. Like it, it, was, it was Jake. Jake will tell you it was six minutes. It was three guys, yeah. and you just didn't really have time. I don't know if Jake asked it. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't ask. ask I asked him why um, the Punisher was never part of the bigger MCU, and was he ever told it was going to be? And that mm -hmm. was that was my that was my extra. Usually with something like that, you kind of get one extraneous question that doesn't have yeah, to do yeah, with yeah. the project. So mm -hmm. I used mine on on Marvel. But but it's solid though. I mean, like, I'm telling you, if you feel safe going to a theater, it's it's really well directed. It's really well shot. It's really well written. Um, there's some things like the, there's some flashback scenes that I thought were kind of like took get, took me out of the movie a little bit. Um, but it's it's very well at performed. Like Bernthal is Bernthal is an unbelievable actor. He's an, an incredible actor, and I love watching him. So we were talking about Oscar Isaac in Dune. Uh, he also has a movie coming out now called The Card Counter. Who saw Jake. that? Jake, you saw a Card Counter. Yeah. Um, How was it? It is a, a collection of bad choices that could have been easily avoided. <laughs> Paul Schrader, um, though. It's Paul Schrader, but but the first and, and, and most glowing thing for me is, and look, I like her. I like her for, like, in, in the world of comedy. But Tiffany Haddish, as of this moment, is not a good enough actress to to pull off these these dramatic roles. Okay. Um, to me, it's, it's, like, I just saw Tiffany Haddish the whole time. And in fact, mm -hmm. I saw, like, Tiffany Haddish almost trying to refrain from being the Tiffany Haddish that we know in, in, in the comedies. To me, she just she just stood out of this project. It just like the scenes with her and Oscar Isaac were, were really awkward and uncomfortable for me. Um, it was, you know, it just felt like Oscar Isaac was super submerged in this part and Tiffany Haddish was there trying to act. Mm. Um, but uh, and, and then also the story takes these really weird turns in terms of um, the character <sighs> Sort of experiencing some PTSD and and moral issues with a lot of horrible decisions he made during the war and how that comes back up and and I, there were just a lot of things that they were that were awkwardly unexplained and and I don't know and a lot of character decisions where you just sort of go like is that what that person would have done for real in that moment um, it's it's a lot of of a list talents bringing C level game. Okay. All right, let's get to Malignant. Uh, Malignant is the new James Wan horror film that is currently available. You guys should be listening to this episode on a Friday. So it is in theaters right now and is a, on HBO Max streaming. Uh, I have heard through the grapevine that it is very, very good. They did not press screen this film for us, but but and usually I know that that's an indicator that uh, it's a bad film, but I've been told uh, that part of the reason that they hit it was just to keep some of the secrets for the film. And so... Um, if you have a chance, go check out James Wan's new film, Malignant. And then on Netflix, finally, for this weekend movies, uh, an action film called Kate, which I know Kevin really liked a lot, too. Jake, you liked it, too? Love yeah. it. Yeah. Right, yeah we, both, we both love this movie. This is coming from the, uh, I think it's 8711. Is that the production company that David Leach and Chad Stelheski have? Um, oh, it's uh, those guys? Nice. Yeah. So That's this awesome. is like in the in the same family as like Nobody and Atomic Blonde and John Wick. And just uh, not not that they're in the same world, but they're coming from that same like background um i've said this before on the show when we had still Heskey on for was it john wick three he was a yeah. great interview anybody out there listening to the show right now if you have a he chance go awesome. back and listen to it yeah there's a he gives an explanation about dogs about how they did the dog fight sequence specifically with halle yeah. berry and, and keanu reeves which is it, it's, God, it's now incredible. you're making me want to go back and listen to that interview that was a good interview. so good so 
Anytime Stelhesky and and Leach or, or that company, I don't know if Stelhesky's name is on this particular. I know I know David Leach is uh, is for sure. But anytime those names are on there, these are these are stunt men. Like these are these are guys who worked in the st- as stuntmen in in films. So like stunt experts. They un- yeah, They're they experts. understand. Yeah, they understand action more than more than uh, more than anything. Um, so that's why the action in Atomic Blonde and the action in John Wick is so immersive because there's not a lot of cuts because they're choreographing it because they know that audiences are smart enough to see past all that. So now we're at Kate, where you know essentially Mary Elizabeth Winstead's character is a, a contract killer, right, Jake? We could say mm-hmm. that. Um, she gets poisoned. Um, she has 24 hours to live, so she decides to go after the people who poisoned her, essentially. Or go out. Okay. And, and there's a, there's a, there's, there's an interesting element where she um, meets this young girl and, and takes her along the way, and, and she's tied somehow into what into Kate's past and kind of something Kate did. Um, so the film is really, like, incredible in terms of visual. Like, uh, they use a lot of natural lighting. And I say natural lighting, but... You know, you're you're shooting in Japan and you have all these massive buildings that are lit up. So they're able to use that natural lighting from the buildings, natural in the sense that, you know, it's from a building. But it's like it's beautiful to look at. And the action is immersive. And Mary Elizabeth Winstead is fantastic. Um, I think that Jake and I were both surprised by this because, I you know, I didn't know what to expect. The trailer was fine. But Mary Elizabeth Winstead is such a badass. Like her performance in this is um, it's amazing watching her in these action scenes. Woody Harrelson's great in this. Like he's really good in this. And he's kind of like, wasn't it more brutal than you thought? Like it was it is oh. to, to quote the great Josh Brolin. It is brutal. It's brutal. brutal. Oh, yeah. 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 But <laughs> but I mean, you have this coming from a production company, like I said, because Stelhesky and Leach were on The Matrix. You know, Chad Stelhesky was, I believe, if I remember correctly, was Leah was a Neo stuntman was, yeah, was yeah. Uh, Keanu Reeves a stuntman. So like these guys understand action and they, they didn't direct the film, but it's coming from their company. So you can expect like incredible action. I want to shout out nobody again. Cause I, I think that feel like that movie flew under the radar a little bit. Bob Odenkirk, uh, another one from that production company, great action. But so Kate I, is surprisingly great. Like surprisingly watched, very yeah. good. I watched the first half of nobody on a plane. Uh, out to Los Angeles. Ugh, don't say that. And then I watched the second half coming home. Terrific. It's a terrific movie. <laughs> Christopher Lloyd is so badass in that movie. Like Chris, yeah, that, yeah. That, Christopher Lloyd is amazing in Nobody. Kevin, is Kevin, so Kevin off I, the I think Sean just wants everything wild. to be two movies. Like he just he just wants <laughs> everything in his life so yeah. much so that he'll split it up even when it's clearly meant to be one movie. Okay, he'll split yeah. it up into two. I didn't understand. I don't understand the industry's need to make mary elizabeth winstead happen like i just why don't... she's awesome uh, she scott is. pilgrim smashed if you haven't seen her performance um in her season of fargo mm. uh she gives a really great performance that season 10 cloverfield lane i'll throw out there she's fantastic in that you know what 10 cloverfield she... lane is, is. amazing oh, yeah. Yeah, i do love her, yeah her and john, john goodman, goodman deserved are... an oscar nomination yeah. john goodman so good all john three Goodman's of them are great, great. i love Wait. that a defense of mary elizabeth winstead turned into me saying well, John Goodman's great. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. she makes him great in that movie. She's great in that film. I, We're I, off topic. I, We're way Scott, off topic. Scott Pilgrim, Not really. She's though. in Kate. She's in Kate. She's the. She's Kate. She's Kate. Is she Kate? She's Kate. <laughs> she's Kate. I don't know. I just, I feel, no, Scott Pilgrim is Edgar Wright's worst movie. We know that. What? That's his no, worst movie. You, no, you, it's not. You haven't even seen all of his movies. Which one haven't I seen? Did you see it World's End? No, I haven't seen World's End yet. No. But I know it's, it's better than... I know it's you don't know Pilgrim. that by definition. You don't know that. No, I do. Know Scott that. Pilgrim's his worst movie. It's not. It's his worst movie. It is it's not. N- it's it's nowhere near his worst movie. What are you talking? We're gonna about? have to play Edgar Wright blend. You're his worst too. movie. Shut up. What what if we start <laughs> doing a blend game but worst? Oh. That sounds really negative and not fun. Have you ever heard this show ever? <laughs> yeah, and I actively fight against it. All right, let's get to this week's blend game. Uh, Did you ever this- see Smashed with Mary Elizabeth Winstead? Uh-uh. Never saw it, dude. Sounds like you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Is that when she opens a burger chain, Smash Burger? <laughs> no. Uh, Tell me more about how we should be positive, Gabe. Hashtag James. Oh, you can be Wan. negative to each other. I'm just positive to the filmmaker. Yeah? Sure. Uh, Kevin, where are work. you going for hashtag James Wan blend celebration of the great James Wan? So this is a definitive line between favorite and best um always i know 
I know. But I, 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 if you guys don't mind, I'd like to just at least just say I think the best movie he's made is The First Conjuring. Okay. Um, just from a purely cinematic storytelling direction, um, I think it's the best movie. It's ever fantastic. Made. Right. But my James Wan uh, blend pick is a personal thing that uh, because I'll never forget seeing the first Saw movie the first time I saw it. Oh. Um, saw, I thought you were going to say it. Aquaman and this was going to no. go in a weird... I honestly thought he was going to say Furious 7. I thought you were going to say Furious true, 7. Oh, true, true, true. Yeah. I do love Furious 7. Now, Furious yeah. 7, again, is a better movie than the first Saw, but I'm going with Saw. Okay. Be- because... Did you say Furious 7 is better than Saw? I think Furious 7 is better Continue than Saw. talking about Saw. We'll just skirt right over I it. do. I do. I, I, I think, would agree with him. I would agree. It is. Have you seen Carrie Elway's performance in Saw? It's horrible. It's not good. It's one of the worst performances I've ever seen. It's so it's terrible. Um, it's, <laughs> it's very really bad. bad. But it's very bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, anyways, so the reason why I chose Saw is I will never forget being in college. It was. Sorry. I think it was my. What? What? Go ahead, Gabe. Go ahead. I just, the irony of talking about a performance in one movie is is worse than performances in the fast franchise is astounding to me <laughs> yeah. continue i didn't mean to cut you vin off diesel my brain broke is better closing. vin diesel is better than in furious 7 than carrie always is in saw we don't I need to, we don't need to stick on it I keep talking about saw i'm sorry um i'm not sorry actually uh but all right, going back to college so i was in college so this was right at the at the start and i'm going to use this term i don't like this term but i'm going to use this term because this is what was kind of set by these movies which was torture porn was the oh, yeah. what no, was the was the genre the that mm-hmm. came out of this but if you guys remember before saw one we never really saw something like that in a in a in a in a, in a broad theater major release Very like true. sold out theaters like people just going to see a horror movie and then experiencing something like that think, I'm think sure about were... how far those movies have come to your point like remember like at the end when that first movie came out it was like we were getting antsy about whether or not a guy was going to cut his foot off and now within the first right. five minutes of the last one it's like watch this dude rip his tongue out as a train right. like is like pl- plowing like think about how far right like, like we we've come to accept those things and and while i i had seen films that had that had done very disturbing things to characters like i mean obviously like i mean set you can go back as far as seven um but you never saw the the actions of those it was more of the aftermath but saw kind of created this like very interesting movement in horror that i that i don't remember seeing prior to saw um so i'll never forget being in college at george mason university freshman year my friend Sean Metzger and I went to see the movie together and it was like a midnight showing. I think it was a Thursday night or either or either Thursday or Friday night. And, you know, I think either we had class the next day, but we were like, hey, I heard this movie is insane. We got to get out and see it. And I, I think I went to the Lee Highway Multiplex in Fairfax, Virginia. I was going to George Mason at the time and like pulling up. I literally could see us parking in the parking lot, getting out of the car and then being excited to walk in and buy that ticket. Like it was it was it was like it was like we were going to see something new because people had talked about how crazy it was. And I just remember sitting in that theater and just my jaw dropping. I had never seen anything like that hype of horror before. Um, you know, I, I say Carrie Elway's performance is bad. It is bad in the movie. But that being said, it is it, it was a game changer in terms of that style of horror. Now. Granted, I'm 37 years old now. I don't like those movies anymore. I can't. I, I, the older I get, the less I watch stuff like that. And then obviously Hostel came, became a thing. And then they make like nine Saw films eventually. Wait, Kev, like, who's you... worse? Carrie Ellis in the first Saw or Chris Rock in, in Spiral? <laughs> Probably Carrie Elway's in the first Saw. It's close, <laughs> I mean, though. It's, it's, a ba- it's not a good performance, but it's so weird because the movie was so shocking that the first time I saw it, I didn't really think about Carrie Elway's performance. It's just... I am saying Elway's right. Right is right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, Elway's right. Always. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always make You're sure. You're not shocked. You're good. I know, I know. Um, but I, I don't know. There was something about that experience that in my mind, I will never forget walking out of it and just having a conversation with my friends at like two in the morning on the way home, mm. going back to our dorm. And it was just like, it was just an experience I'll never forget. And it was, I, it, that's like a pinpointed moment in my life where a film came out that is that that changed the game of cinema in terms of that genre. Um, and, you know, obviously movies got way more brutal since so the first saw is almost like not even that crazy anymore compared to what we're watching now but if you put yourself in that time frame in that year 
and you and you remember what Saw was. It was a big deal. And then like the sequels were huge. It was such a big deal. What are they going to do next? What's going to happen? What's the kill going to be while. like? Then it felt. Yeah, off. it was. Off. So I, 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 that's why I went with Saw. Jakey, tell us why you chose uh, the pit bull scene from Aquaman. Oh God, <laughs> better than uh, <laughs> Fury Seven. Um, no, look, it's I, not. I, I no, also, it's not. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> look, I also chose Saw, and Aww. I think um, to to sort of expand on on Kevin's point, yeah, the the huge. fact that this movie is such a really cool snapshot of a moment is mm-hmm. I'll go as far as saying that movie looks best when you watch it on DVD. It is not meant to be watched on Blu-ray. It is not meant to be watched on 4K. That is a movie that was made for $18, and the higher definition you watch that film, the more you're able to look and go, What about like VHS? Does it, like, oh, it would probably look great on VHS. It might yeah. look good like bootleg, like like George Costanza in a, like in a theater holding an old <laughs> video camera. But yeah, it's just it's a grungy movie that was made for a shoestring budget, and the more you do, you go into like you know high definition, the more it picks apart how that movie was not meant to be seen, which is a testament that it was just sort of of this moment. But to Kevin's point, I remember where I was yeah. sitting. In the, if you were to take me back to the Cinemark 18 movie theater in Webster, Texas, where I saw yeah. saw with my folks and my sister, I could walk you to the theater and point out the seat I was sitting in, yeah. where I my mind wow. was blown when. Absolutely. Thing X happens. I don't want to say what. What year case, did so, what year did Saw come out? Two thousand five, I believe. Two thousand four, uh, no. maybe. Two thousand four, two thousand three. I was in high school. I was I in high school. Two. I think it was two thousand. Wait, hold I on. was definitely in high school. Um, but I remember oh, so it was two thousand four. So okay. it was actually my sophomore year then. Yeah. All right. Cool. So yeah, I, I remember exactly where I was and just sort of my mind being blown. And you know, I was earlier in the show I was talking about uh, Endgame loving that experiences of watching other people watch the movie saw is one of those movies that i love coming across someone who has some for some reason or another never seen it and and doesn't know what happens and again i don't want to say what happens because if you haven't seen it go go watch it but there is a thing that happens multiplied by what is i think one of the great horror movie themes of all time the saw theme is like oh yeah maybe not quite up there with john carpenter's halloween theme but it's up there. Like, it is a great movie theme. The reveal when, montage. The reveal yeah. uh. multiplied um, by what I, I think is, I believe the theme is called Hello, Zep. Um, because it's a reference to uh, to Michael Emerson's character, the great Michael Emerson uh, from, from Lost. Um, the great Michael Emerson. It's called Hello, Zep. When Hello, Zep starts playing, when Thing X happens, I don't know how anyone watching that doesn't go, holy shit. Mm. It is incredible and i love just the dirtiness and the grunginess of it i love that it almost feels like a student film like he didn't have that much more money than it's than, than a college film does um which is why i say don't watch it in 4k it's not meant to be seen in 4k um it's just a just a great snapshot of of a moment in horror and i feel like we're almost to the point where you go back and and watch when you watch the original 70s texas chainsaw massacre where it looks dirty and grungy and you can tell they had nothing to work with and you can almost feel the stickiness of the fake blood and the smell of like the texas heat making all of those like everything just rot you can almost just feel the grossness of it i feel the same way about the original saw it's a dirty, dirty movie. It is a dirty, yeah, dirty, it, it, but in the best way possible, yeah. it's a dirty movie. But we and agree I, I, that, that yeah. Conjuring's a better film, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Conjuring's yes. a better made film, um, yeah. but I'm not sure story-wise it's it's better. Okay. But you can't get past Carrie Elway's performance in the first Saw. I can't not think about how bad that performance is. It's a bad performance. Well, my pick I went with Insidious. Insidious. Yeah. Insidious might be his scariest film. Yes. I'd Insidious say, is Conjuring, terrifying. Conjuring's his scariest movie. I think Insidious is scary. Put but, Insidious but, back on if you haven't watched it in a while. Oh, I've seen it. Also, it's terrifying. Insidious 2 is great. It's terrifying. And Insidious is why I want to give James Wan a ton of credit for. Because James Wan is so confident in his ability to scare an audience um, that he doesn't have to do uh, the, all the lame tricks that come with horror. Uh, and that's why I think the twist in Saw works as well as it does. And Insidious, he does the stupid things just like the, uh, a front door being open, you know, when when nobody they knew nobody was around it, or um, you know, there's a rocking chair in the kid's room that's rocking, uh, at, you know, and there's a door sort of covering who might be sitting in the chair, uh, and Rose Byrne has to pull the door open and see who's there, and of course no no one's there. Um, it's not cheesy jump scares, and there's a moment in it that just 
still to this day scares the freaking daylights out of me is that Rose Byrne is taking out trash uh, and she goes outside of the house. And the minute she leaves the house, the record player starts to play uh, like 40s music, like just obviously period 30s or 40s music. And as the camera pans past the window and shows into the room where the record player is, there's a little boy in period garb and he's dancing in front of the record player. And I'm just like, fuck, fuck you. I'm not watching the rest of this movie. It just, he just knows how to get underneath your skin. And um, it's brilliant. He's brilliant. Um, he does a great g- g- uh, gag with the um, baby monitor, you know, as Rose Byrne is downstairs and she hears voices speaking over the monitor and up in her kid's room. I think I mentioned before that, like, the first time I saw this, we ha- had a baby and we had baby monitors all around our house and they did this this gag and I was <laughs> horrified. And uh, it's the only movie where I actually had to. It was after the dancing boy in front of the mic uh, in front of the record player. And I was the only one in the theater because it was a press screening. I was by myself and I had to walk outside. I had to walk outside and just get into some place where it was light uh, and catch my bearings <laughs> and say there's no dancing 30 year old the kid from the 30s standing behind me in the theater uh i now really... know what prank i want to pull on sean if i could please, ever find a way to make it to, to, to charlotte please dress in, dress in those clothes and dance, <laughs> dance in front of a record player as i take the trash out uh it'd be incredibly effective but i you know i love Juan. i just think Juan is true that's why i'm so excited for malignant because i just think yeah horror is his genre it's it's cool that he's getting a chance to sort of explore you know big ticket storytelling in the aquaman franchise but um, I don't think he'll ever drift too far away from horror, and uh, and so for that reason, I uh, adore it. To your point about him never, le- James Wan never leaving horror. The best parts, the best moments in Aquaman are the horror moments. Yeah, where yeah. you could tell like, oh, he's 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 oh, it's, bad. It shot. like hums. It's like yeah. the rest of the movie is feels like a superhero action movie. Yeah, not necessarily in a bad way, but definitely in a rote way. Mm. Um, and then you get to those horror moments, yeah. and it's just. Uh, he's got so much experience and he's so good at it. They hum on a different, a different if frequency than the rest of the movie. If all of Aquaman had been like the trench scene yeah. and the trench yeah. monster, it would have been one of the greatest superhero movies of all time. Remember that, that one so shot good. looking up at the ocean with all that? Like, it was like a painting. Uh, that one like epic and they're shot. swimming down yeah. and everything's yes. following after them. Well, Great. I mean, Gabe's 100% right. The best horror moment in that film is when Aquaman comes out of the water to Pitbull's uh, song. And that, 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 to me, is one of the most horrifying <laughs> scenes horrifying. I've ever seen. Sh- in I get movie. shivers just at the, <laughs> when the beat drops. Huh, huh. Uh, I want to mention, too, I got a chance to watch uh, James Wan work. They filmed the first Conjuring here in North Carolina back when Wilmington was still a, a hotbed for filming. And um, if you have never met him before... I'd say this to you guys because there's a chance you might have, at least for their interviews. He, he is the nicest person in the world. Like he He's could so not nice. be, he could not be more nice and kind. And so to think that these demented horror films come from come from this man is is just hilarious. For, to me. for the first also, Conjuring junket, we got James paired with the real Lorraine Warren. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's a really cool he, get. You yeah. also got to think about how his his how how wide ranging his 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 filming filmography yeah. is. Like mm-hmm. to do Furious Seven. And then from Saw to, you know, Conjuring, it's Death kind Sentence. Of, is that the Kevin Bacon sentence, one? That's actually a really good remake. Mm-hmm. Um, I mm-hmm. actually liked that sentence. I thought it was pretty solid. Well, let's a get great to, director. Let's get to audience picks. Uh, Rupert Everton went with me and said Insidious. Indy Christina says, I'm not a horror genre fan yet. I enjoy a good gothic tale. Uh, or ghost stories such as The Conjuring, uh, which plays like a police procedural. Harry Vanderbag said Aquaman. Uh, Carrie Vanderberg, I'm sorry, said Aquaman. Rachel Bowen and John Palmer both said Saw. So thank you, everybody, who participated this week. Uh, next week, we're going to be celebrating the talents of a fantastic character actress. Uh, hashtag Alfrey Woodard. Woodard. Oh, Al- wow. Hold on. Let me try that again. Hashtag I, I believe it's Alfrey Woodard Al- Blunt. I think it's Alfrey, I believe. Alfrey? I Alfrey. believe. I think um, it's Alfrey. I'm okay. going to hold. I'm going to hold tight to Alfrey. All right, I'm almost certain I interviewed her recently. I think it's Alfre Woodard, but oh. no, I but du- double check that. I could be wrong. We'll come back next s- week with a yeah. go back the over answer. her filmography and uh, and make your Damn. pick using using the hashtag or going to uh, realblend at cinnamonblend.com, which is where you can email us, and that is also where you can send us a review. And we have a review this week for the to, for the old podcast, and this one's from someone named R Mad M A D D. 
and uh, they call it my favorite. Real Blend is a great podcast for film fans. It's great to hear others that are as passionate about film as I am. I was a follower of Jake's years ago, so long that I remember eagerly awaiting his interviews with the cast of The Dark Knight Rises. I acknowledge all of its flaws, but I still love it. Does he mean the movie or your interviews with the cast? I wonder. Probably both. <laughs> then I found Kevin's interviews on YouTube, and it was great to find another person with similar passion. Lo and behold, I discover Kevin and Jake are friends and have a podcast together. I immediately checked Real Blend out. It still surprises people. I still have people being like, you should meet this Kevin McCarthy guy. And I'm like, no, I he heard he's a dick. <laughs> uh, That's me. was introduced to the wonderful Mr. Sean O'Connell and MVP Gabe. Years later, and I'm still checking for the new Real Blend episode toward the end of each week. These guys are great to listen to amongst themselves and get the best interviews out of today's filmmakers. Tarantino, Soderbergh, and Mike Flanagan may be my favorites so far. <laughs> Give Real Blend a listen. If you are a film fan, you won't regret it. That Flanagan one is... <laughs> I don't think I've laughed harder in an interview than, than the, fake, I mean, the fake of Tremblay. It, there's a video of the Flanagan interview on our on our, on our YouTube channel, yeah. on the Real Blend YouTube channel. When we got into fake of Tremblay, I think I mean we were two hour, almost two hours into this interview, and I, I think I fell out of my chair like four times. I, I he was could so not easy stop to laughing. talk to. He was the he best. Was, yeah, he had so many good stories. He's just very good on this show. So it's it's rare that we get those super long interviews, but when we do, they always pay off because yeah. a half hour in, when we're usually done, it's like it's officially we're just hanging out, and they. Yeah. I mean, they're filmmakers who work on some of the greatest films of our yeah. time and have some of the most interesting stories to tell, and they just start to... And that one in particular for Dr. Sleep, which is incredible. Yeah. His director's yeah, cut of Dr. Movie. Sleep is... And, is, and I really oh. want to go back and re-listen because, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't he, like, on the set of Midnight Mass when he was talking to us? And he was... Now, I, now they I've were editing a Bly Manor. And he might have been on the set of Mass. He might have been I on the set of... I he was were, on the set of and Mass. And they were editing... already in production. Okay. He was just, I think because he said uh, they were editing Bly, and I think you're right. I think he was in like Vancouver and or where they were shooting that. Actually, um, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but you guys, you've seen his film Hush yes. that he did yes. uh, with his wife. Um, in, in, in the film, the, the lead character um, is, is a writer who she is, uh, she's deaf and obviously she can't hear the, the killers break into her house. She's a writer who just had a book come out, and that book... It's called Midnight Mass. No kidding. Is yeah. that what this show is? I don't know. I'm gonna. I want to ask him because then in Gerald's game, I was gonna say, when, isn't the book in yeah, Gerald's when game? She's, yeah. When she's handcuffed to the bed, there's a book yeah. on her. I think her bedside table, and the book is Midnight Mass. That's funny. Hey, hey Sean, did you hear? Did you hear about Mike Flanagan's favorite Jim Carrey movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh... <laughs> It's not that good, by the way. This is going to bomb. I'm, just letting you know. I'm a little rusty. We used to do this all the time. I haven't done these in a while. I don't oh, dude, know what don't it feel is. bad. They weren't that good before. I don't know what it is. I know. No. What is, is it? Is it Bly Blyer Blyer Manor? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of works. That's I'm good. okay with that. That right. was good. I'll take right. that. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. All right. Um, our next premium episode. <laughs> which will drop on Monday. We're going to be doing the 2006 Oscars year in review, which means the films that came out in 2005. We're going to discuss whether the Academy got it right or whether they got it wrong. And you can get access to our premium episodes by going to cinemablend.com backslash real blend premium. Make sure you sign up. Uh, it's five, five small dollars a month that gets you such great content from the real blend guys. Uh, if you just want to follow us on social media, we are at Jake's takes. Hey, at Sean. Kevin McCarthy TV. Hold on. At Sean underscore O'Connell. At Gabe Kovach and at Real Blend. Yes, Kevin. Just wondering if you knew uh, James Wan's favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger film. It's not an <laughs> obvious one. I'll give you that. The, yeah. ru the running one? No, I was going to do Saw Deal. Like, Rod, remember Raw Deal, that movie? <laughs> Raw, <laughs> Deal. Raw Deal. Raw <laughs> Deal. Deep Saw Deal. Saw Deal. <laughs> Pretty good. Remember Raw Deal? Nicole? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes, I did. I think a few deep. people might. A couple. Uh, Saw we'll Deal. See you guys next week. Have your Wait, what's your Spielberg? Everyone got a Spielberg ready? Uh, yeah. The yeah, Adventures I mean, of Tintin. Munich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Munich. War of the Worlds. Shh.